Hello and welcome to this instalment of Newswire. Um, July's been quite a busy month actually. It seems to be that the revenue are clearing the decks before everybody disappears on school holidays. So we've had quite a lot of movement within that. And I think probably the first thing to note is uh, making tax digital. Uh, re really a parting shop, hear some draft legislation and then run off quick. Um, but interestingly, um, something that's appeared very late in July is consultation on getting rid of basis periods. Oh, well, that's probably the wrong expression. Um, aligning basis periods essentially with the tax year for the start of um, making tax digital. Now, bearing in mind for income tax, what was being talked about there is essentially 23, 24. So really saying, you know, to make it work, returns are going to have to be on a quarterly basis, uh, April, May, June, submitted in July, and so on and so forth. Uh, so quite a fundamental change. Consultation, uh, nothing's been mentioned about this so far. So I think maybe keep an eye on that. And if you are interested, we will be running detailed uh, MTD courses early in um, September and October to give you the, the current state of play. Uh, the other issue with that is uh, then associated penalties, late filing penalties will change, late payment penalties will change. Um, all part of this year's Finance Act course. So if you've not watched a Finance Act course, then, then obviously have a look at that. But again, that will be picked up as part of those MTD courses. So some quite significant announcements, albeit in a very early sort of, sort of phase at the moment. Most of the other announcements uh, in July relate to coronavirus um, and the various schemes and support measures that have been put in place. Uh, so the first thing that we've seen is an announcement relating to what the revenue are going to do in relation to um, outstanding debt, what their approach will be. Uh, obviously, most of the, um, I suppose, direct support measures relating to you can pay your income tax a bit late, um, your VAT deferral, if you remember from last year, that three month period, sort of m March to June last year, we had the ability to defer really all of those are gone now and we're moving into the phase actually you need to sort out how you're going to pay us that money if you haven't already done so so that announcement from the revenue in terms of uh, coronavirus and tax payments is really saying reading between the lines there are no direct agreements still out there in terms of or direct offers if that's the right expression but we are open and relaxed if that's the right expression to do with um, time to pay arrangements. So it's basically saying, you know, we are sympathetic, get in touch with us, we'll try and sort something out. So again, uh, a lot of those support measures have disappeared. I think probably the important thing in terms of uh, VAT, and we've covered this again in our, our Finance Act courses. So again, if you've not seen one yet, have a, have a listen. But I think one of the things in there is the reimposition of penalties for not paying that deferred amount. So if you've not if, if you've not entered into some sort of arrangement with the revenue now, the potential is penalties are going to be there for that deferred amount of VAT. So I think the moral for clients, if, if they are still struggling cash flow wise, if they have problems with their tax position, uh, the moral of that is get in touch with the revenue sooner rather than later and get something agreed. The second announcement that's come through in terms of COVID support is again related to a Finance Act issue. So again, um, for previous comments apply, if you've not seen the course, then then have a look at that course. For those of you that did, the what, we've been through this before, but essentially loss, like loss carrybacks, extended loss carrybacks um, for the self-employed and for limited companies. Um, that two year extension. Now what, what the revenue, um, what the law does, what the revenue have done here is essentially say, A, claims have to be made via the return primarily. So please don't try and amend uh, year two, year three back for that extended loss carry back because that's not the way you do it. You put the details in the current return and then obviously we generate a repayment potentially for those earlier two years. But then we get the issue about the de minimis claim. So as you know, that overriding cap to year two, year three is two million quid. Um, now, what the law does say is for relatively small claims and by that claims of up to £200,000, then you can um, claim that via a slightly different process as an interim measure, uh, the de minimis process. And what the revenue have done in the last month is essentially activate an online facility to do that. So the theory of this 
is that you can go online, put your details in, um, uh, give draft figures, management accounts, whatever it may be. But if let's say you, your management accounts show that you're making a, a 373 million pound loss, then the revenue will be prepared to say actually 200,000 of that extended loss carryback can be processed outside of the returns process uh, based on you know, potentially draft figures. Now, personally, uh, we've seen this sort of in the past in different forms. I'm not the greatest fan of doing that. I think I would rather be saying to the client, look, the sooner you get the proper information in, the sooner you pay us, the sooner we're in a position to make those claims based on actual figures to avoid any you know, potential issues with that. But the theory is there. Uh, those online portals are available. Uh, the easiest way to find it is just Google, you know, HMRC extended loss carryback sort of thing, and you'll, you'll find it there. Um, so quite significant movement at the moment um, post passage of the Finance Act that, that has now been activated by the revenue. And the final element of um, the Newswire is a little snippet to do with self-employed income support, um, the announcement of the uh, fifth version, um, the, the blog uh, for this month you'll see within the main body of the text also links to um, the fifth version. As has happened, quite interestingly, self-employed income support, all the, all the versions are different. Um, the first couple uh, were very similar. Uh, the third one was very different to the first two. The fourth one was a bit different to the third. And the fifth one is different again. It's all with different terms. You have within there, first of all, the significant reduction of profit issue. And I've had some correspondence with the revenue directly about this recently to say, well, in trying to judge whether profits have significantly reduced uh, when looking at that test, do you have to include support measures, i.e. Um, previous self-employed income support grants, local authority grants, furlough payments if that's relevant and so on and so forth, or do you exclude those? Because the law seems to infer that you include them in that test, but that in my mind defies common sense. Surely you were saying your real turnover would have been less than 30% or gone down more than 30% um, without HMRC government support. And the revenue have confirmed that in actual fact you exclude all those support payments in judging whether the significant reduction has taken place. Of course, the other element of that, they haven't defined what significant actually means, which would be useful to consider what they think is, you know, the test is. Um, but that that is starting to change. The other thing is the revenue will want to see, uh, because obviously with the fifth grant, there are two levels of grant. So in order to get the maximum grant, you're gonna to have to show that your turnover uh, was affected to the tune of more than 30%. Um, and again, within that test, um, the, the rather strange thing with that is you have got to provide figures essentially for the actual tax year 2021, primarily, you know, assuming that you were trading in, in 2021. Um, so for, for anybody on a sort of non-5th of April year end, you're going to have to dredge out turnover figures um, that are not contemporaneous with the basis period to be able to support that claim. And I, and I think, again, what you will see with all the self-employed income support grants is that because the interaction is primarily between the, the client and the revenue, cutting you out of play, there are no doubt going to be some significant problems in the fullness of time with some of these claims because, um, you know, the, the layper, they are fairly complicated tests, the later three, and the layperson just says, you know, I think I qualify fine. Yeah, but there's a lot of technicalities. So the, the blog goes into some more detail. The revenue have released the guidance on that. Um, it isn't all embracing guidance, I have to say, but it is there. So again, um, uh, more movement in the, uh, in the world of self-employed income support. But touch wood, he said at this stage, very quickly, uh, touch wood, this will be the final self-employed income support grant we ever encounter. We will not need any in the future. And, you know, the, the coronavirus and all this sort of thing will become a dim and distant memory uh, moving into next year. So, uh, uh, again, thanks for uh, listening in on our um, July news. Well, I have a good break over the summer, those of you that are having a break. And uh, I will see you again, hopefully, face to face in the autumn. Uh, we are running face to face courses. So um, if you want fancy face to face instead of Zoom, please log on to those courses. And I hopefully see some of you in a real sense in the not too distant future. Bye.
Well, thanks as ever, Mark. Uh, so welcome to the a a section with me, Jeremy Williams, and it's uh, end of July. Uh, and it's been a relatively quiet month in terms of uh, the audit and accounting, as you'll see in the uh, digital copy of Newswire. But the first item is going to be seismic in its importance for audit firms, at least. And that is the long awaited final issuance of the ISQM suite, uh, the International Standards on Quality Management for Audit. Uh, and that's ISQM1, which is the main standard, ISQM2, which deals with uh, engagement quality control review, and ISA 220, which is the ISA in the regular suite of auditing standards that deals with uh, quality on an individual engagement. So we've expected this for some time. We've had an exposure draft out in the UK. There is quite a long lead time for these to come in, you might think, because uh, at first glance, at least, this is periods commencing 15th of December 2022. However, don't be fooled by that date. Uh, while as far as ISA 220 and ISQM2 are concerned, uh, that is about uh, quality on engagements for periods beginning on or after that date and um, EQC reviews of uh, periods beginning that date. As far as the main ISQM1 standard is concerned, that's the effective date that you need to have your quality management system up and running. It's the 15th of December, 2022. And that's not actually very far away. So firms of all sizes will need to start to prepare for a new quality management system. Uh, I think two key features of the system will be that it will have to be proactive. Uh, firms can't simply rely, for example, on conducting file reviews after the event to determine whether or not they've hit the right quality. They'll need to demonstrate what policies and procedures they've got in place to ensure quality is right before it happens. Uh, and that means thinking about team training, uh, team resources, who does which audits, uh, how we assess the risk for us as a firm and how we address that uh, up front. So it's got to be proactive. Secondly, it's going to have to be tailored. Uh, firms will have to make sure that their plan is bespoke for them. Uh, so there won't be any question of buying a manual off the shelf and um, putting it back on another shelf and you know, saying to the QAD inspector or the ACCA inspector, there's my quality control procedures. You're going to have to make sure that you tailor the issue for your firm, for your audit team, for the client base that you have and for the particular risks that you have to address. So I'm not going to say a huge amount about the ISQMs on this update. It's just to announce that they're there. Please go to the FRC's website and download your copy. But if you are a regular attendee on our courses, expect to see us ramping up more and more content on the ISQMs as we go through the back half of 2021 and into 2022 as we get ready for that 15th of December effective date. So there we go, that's the first topic. Uh, second topic you can see in Newswire is that there is a draft LLP SORP. Uh, so if you're involved in LLP accounts, either as an accounts preparer or as an auditor, uh, then get hold of the exposure draft and have a look at it. Uh, the particular issue, I think the dominant issue that they're addressing is division of profits uh, within LLPs. And I think the feeling is the current LLP SORP still isn't clear enough on exactly how that happens uh, in a way that would apply to every LLP uh, and make it easy to understand. So they're doing their best to clarify that area. Uh, one or two other areas that they're going to address as well. Uh, so again, it's an exposure draft. Uh, I don't want to spend much time on the detail of that, but if you're involved in LLPs, then please follow the link from Newswire. You can get hold of the draft SORP uh, and uh, read it through and um, there'll be time for consultation and comments. Okay, what else is coming up? Well, we've got the Key Facts and Trends publication, that annual staple from the FRC, which I'm sure you're desperate to read as soon as it comes out. No, maybe or not. Um, but it's a useful publication if you want to keep abreast of what's happening in the profession. Uh, lots of interesting statistics to while away the hours with. Uh, I guess um, one of the headline bits of news is that the percentage uh, that challenger firms are taking up of the FTSE 350 is increasing, albeit not massively so, but it's nice to see challenger firms inching their way gradually into the FTSE 350 even if at the present time uh, every every company in the FTSE 100 
is currently audited by the big four. Uh, at least we're heading in the right direction. Uh, it also notes that in general, audit fee income has gone up for firms. Uh, so those and other fascinating tidbits are uh, available for you in that key facts and trends document and once more link in the newswire. The final topic is um, especially for those of you who are involved in academies. Uh, we have a supplementary bulletin to the academies accounts direction, uh, which is largely uh, devoted to COVID related issues. Uh, so again, you know, we're into um, the middle of the um, uh, break in, uh, in the academic year. Uh, academies is very much a seasonal business. Uh, so if you're involved in dealing with academies, then please make sure you get hold of that supplement, read it through uh, and apply it. And um, as before, you've guessed it, links in Newswire. So that is it on our relatively short list um, for this month of July. Um, we've had some stormy weather recently. I hope you do get to enjoy some sunshine. And those of you who are uh, heading off on annual leave um, during the, the uh, traditional month of August, have a wonderful time. And we will see you back at the end of August with more news from the A&A section. Until then, thanks ever so much.